So the um, second one is uh, the, the one that is, let's say, more difficult or the one that is more interesting to analyze, which is the case in which you want to do an address scan, but of a remote network. So obviously, the, you know, the problem, uh, uh, the problem space changes a lot because now you cannot use multicast addresses. So you have to know what are the addresses that you're going to, to try. And this is actually like, uh, uh, you know, at some point in time, uh, nowadays I think, the, let's say, the, 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 the idea changing. But uh, if you go to articles that would be posted, like, let's say, in, in magazines so many years ago, uh, for about, I don't even know how to call that, like uh, talking about IPv6, you'd get these kind of claims quite a lot. Like, uh, no, the attacks are impossible. So I was trying to, you know, this kind of quote is actually, you can find lots of this on, on the internet. And I was trying to find out whether this was actually like the product of, uh, let's say, being under the influence of something, or it was actually, uh, you know, there was some reasoning to this claim. So I guess that, you know, whether that quote over there makes sense or not, well, depends on what's the, uh, what's the question that you, uh, or what's, uh, what is it that you are assuming, or whether actually the search space is, you know, 64 bits. I mean, there could also be the case that people just came with the idea that, uh, you know, scanning attacks are impossible without any reasoning at all, but let's say we are assuming that that wasn't the case here. So before actually getting into the details of whether, you know, these scanning attacks are possible or not, let's say the question that we should be answering is this one, okay? I mean, obviously, if the search space is 64 bits, they are going to be impossible. If the search space is something, let's say, way smaller than that, then it might be possible to actually, you know, be able to perform these uh, address scanning attacks. Now, years ago, there was a guy from Ireland, as far as I remember, uh, David Malone. He had published a study, the only one that had been pub published at the time. Uh, this guy had measured uh, how IPv6 addresses were configured in different kind of systems. For example, in servers, in clients, uh, in routers, etc. Okay, and he had tried to categorize those addresses, you know, based on different kind of types, based on the you know different ways in which you could possibly set the uh, interface ID. Through this, that I mean, he had published that report like maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago. And um, you know, uh, you could easily tell that those results were dated uh, because of you know some kind of viruses that would appear in his report. So I tried to get the guy to you know do the experiment again. I insisted a couple of times, and he was busy with something else. So I had no other option, let's say, than to do it on my own. Not because I wanted, but uh, because I had no option. So what was the experiment about? Uh, again, what we are trying to find here is whether the search space, for example, for scanning some network is 64 bits or not, okay? So the idea here is, uh, or was, to actually try to grab as many IPv6 services as, as possible and try to figure out whether the interface ID was set with some specific pattern or it was just random bits, okay? If it was random bits, that meant that the search space was 64 bits. There, was, there wasn't much to do uh, when it comes to address scans. Now, uh, if there were specific patterns, then that might help the attacker to actually reduce the search space, and maybe in that case, you know, these other scanning attacks were uh, feasible. What I did, I uh, actually obtained two different pieces of, uh, or sources of um, IPv6 addresses. So Alexa, uh, I don't know that much what they do, but they had this uh, interesting file with the top one million sites, uh, top one million websites, and there is an Internet Society um, a website called World IPv6 Lunch Day from you know a few years ago, where they have a list also of uh, you know websites that had enabled IPv6. So the goal here was essentially to try to grab as many addresses as possible and uh, you know and analyze those addresses. Um, so the let's say the. Uh, the, the easiest of all of those addresses was to just to get uh, quite a records for the domain names in each of those lists. But then I say, okay, well, I have addresses corresponding to web servers, but maybe those web servers or the addresses for web servers, maybe they follow different patterns that, I don't know, those of mail servers or those of uh, name servers. So what I did, f using the same two lists, uh, then I obtained the NS records and the corresponding quite a records uh, for those domains and the MX records and the A, uh, quite a records for the same stuff. 
So now we have like three different sets of addresses, one for web servers, one for mail servers, and one for name servers. Uh, once I had those lists, obviously I had to produce a tool to actually uh, analyze the interface IDs. I wasn't going to be one by one, you know, uh, trying to figure out what pattern they were following. And this is, uh, these are essentially the results for, um, for web addresses. The reason for which you have two pies for, let's say, each uh, data set, like here for Alexa and here for the Wall IPv6 uh, launch day, is because in the uh, second one, duplicate addresses have been removed. So for example, if there are multiple sites, multiple domain names that are employing the same IPv6 address, uh, in, the, in, the, in the pie charts that are on top, they will count as many times as you find them, whereas in the lower one, uh, they only count once. Uh, both results are interested, interesting. And before actually getting into the specific patterns, what I think the, the most important part of this slide is that you can see, you know, the, the uh, let's say the categories on the right hand side, and it's clear that obviously addresses are not random because the uh, you know the only ones that are random are the ones that are in dark green over here, and obviously they are just a tiny percentage of those addresses. Okay. Um, maybe the, easy, uh, the, the easiest uh, pattern to, to understand is the one that you have in light blue here. We call them low byte addresses. Th that was the name that this guy, David Malone, had used. So let's say I build this work on his own work. And essentially, our uh, IPv6 addresses where the interface ID is set to all zeros and you just bury the last byte. That would be the usual case when you are manually configuring, let's say, a router, a server. Usually, at least, well, you are under the effect of something similar to the previous guy in the in the slide. Uh, you usually set to all zeros and some number, and you don't go like A, B, four, B. You don't. Um, and you know that should already give you like a hint uh, regarding whether these address scan attacks are going to be possible or not. We started with the assumption that there were like 64 bits to be tried. And now, essentially, we're saying that for a large percentage of the addresses, the interface ID is all zeros, and you just bury the last byte. So this is the same for mail servers. Even, let's say, worse or better, depending on the point of view. Uh, and when you remove the, you know, the duplicate addresses, it's, uh, you, know, you can get the majority of the addresses just by trying addresses for which the interface ID is all zeros, and you just bury the last byte. And this is for DNS. Okay, so obviously, if you think about this topic from the perspective of the attacker, well, obviously you wouldn't just try the whole 64-bit uh, address space. You'd first go for this one, because obviously there you get more than 75% of the addresses. So you target those. After that, you might try to find the other ones, but you know, long hang, uh, low hanging fruit. Um, then there was a guy, you know, after I had published these results, he said, uh, um, he said that he had looked at my results, and he said, well, you don't have any addresses for clients, okay? And I said, well, the, uh, at the time, uh, well, nowadays either, I, I wasn't running any, let's say, popular site where I could, you know, grab so many addresses from clients. And this guy, what he did, he used exactly the same tools, but he ran this, uh, these tools over the log file of a popular web server, so to speak. Now, the results in this slide are actually tricky. So, um, because if you look at what looks like it's almost 70% of the addresses, and you look at the legend over here, they, it says that they are random addresses, okay? Now, what's the problem, or what's the reason for which I, I say that this chart is misleading? Well, because when you have a server, and you're measuring client connections, those clients that employ temporary addresses, like Windows, they will use the temporary address to connect to your server but they still use the same uh, predictable address, like, you know, for example, addresses that embed a MAC address in the interface ID. Now, from the standpoint of, uh, of an attacker, if you are using one predictable address and one that is not, obviously I'm going to target the predictable one. I don't care if you are using some address that is hard to find. As long as you have a single one that is easier to find, you know, I'm okay. And obviously, because of the way these measurements were done, say, looking at the log file of a web server, the only thing that you can tell from this is that 
a large uh, number of systems were employing temporary addresses or randomized addresses when doing outgoing communications, when behaving like a client, okay? But there's nothing that you can say about, you know, which other addresses they were employing. They might have been employing addresses that follow patterns such as the ones in the previous slides. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit of a summary. I mean, there's more to it, but I, I was trying to summarize this as, as much as possible. Um, different patterns that you could see in the previous slide. Uh, first one is well, our addresses that are embed the MAC address of the network interface. This is traditional Slack, okay? Yeah, it's not, you, you don't literally embed the MAC address, but essentially you are embedding the MAC address and you flip a bit and you, uh, you, know, you insert a 16-bit word. At the end of the day, it's the same thing. Uh, so if you look at the, you know, uh, at the numbers or, or the bytes there that I put in bold fonts, well, those, that's supposed to be the MAC address of the corresponding network interface, modulo the fact that there's one bit that has been flipped there, okay? Um, you, now, for example, in this case already, uh, if you look at the address over there, uh, there's uh, certainly the search space, even for those addresses, is not 64 bits. You already have 16 bits that you are forcing to uh, FF, FE, this one, and this one. That's always the case for Slack, okay? Now there's another part, uh, or another piece of information that can help you reduce the search space. If what you're embedding there is a MAC address. Well, you know that the first three bytes of the MAC address is actually the OUI or an identifier that identifies the vendor, okay? Now, if you somehow have information about which vendor that site is employing, well, certainly at least you can reduce the possible numbers that might be there, okay? When it comes to the low order three bytes, uh, it's kind of like tricky, why? Well. In a sense, uh, those three numbers, those uh, low order three bytes could be anything, but if you were to find like one system in the network, usually you will find that MAC addresses are consecutive. Why? Because when the vendor is manufacturing devices, they don't just randomize the MAC address, so they use them as a serial number, so to speak. So I've done the experiment, like even that, you know, you go to some electronic shops and you, let's say, you buy two IP cameras and you check the MAC addresses and it's only the last buy or the last couple of bytes that change. And if you're assuming that some organization, they bought all of the systems, computers or whatever they were, you know, together, which is usually the case, well, it's quite likely that if you look at the MAC addresses, well, once you have one address, the other ones are going to be like, you know, next to it. Another one, is uh, embedding an IPv4 address inside the um, IPv6 interface identifier. There are actually two ways of doing that. The first one is actually something that is in the, uh, that has to do with the IPv6 uh, addressing standard. Essentially, it says that you can actually uh, encode an IPv6, an IPv6 address in this way, okay? And when you uh, write an address in that way, the IPv4 address gets encoded in the low order 32 bits. So we are going to have 32 bits that are going to be all zeros, and then that IPv4 address that we have here is encoded in the low order 32 bits. Now, if you look at you know, what people do in practice, and this is not something that has to do with standards, you just, do, you just look at what people do and you, know, you find this kind of thing, there's also people that they set the interface identifier in this way. So now there's no special encoding here, it's just people configuring an address manually, but rather than, for example, selecting the interface ID to all zeros and then just bury the last byte, in each 16-bit word, they include each of the bytes of the IPv4 address, okay? Now the interesting part is obviously if you have addresses like this, two types, like the, the ones that embed IPv4 addresses, the search space becomes the same one as in IPv4. So yeah, you do have more bits for the interface identifier, but you're not using them. There's another one that is kind of uh, like interesting. Uh, this was actually found in the wild. It's not that usual, but it is there. There's people that, for example, if they have a number of web servers in their network, they set the addresses in this way. For example, you can see that only the uh, low order 32 bits are set. So they use one number, for example here, this one, is kind of like the number of server. So the first word server will have one, second two, and, and so on. 
And then they, for the uh, low order 16 bits, they just set the port number of the, let's say, main service that is being provided by that server. So if it's a web server, you'll find the number 80 there. Now, the creativity of people doesn't have limits, so there's people that decide to do things in the other way around. So, and it actually gets even worse. Uh, so there's people that put the you know, port number first and then the server number after that. And we even found cases for me that was like, uh, I don't even know how to describe that. Some people encode the port number in hexadecimal. For me, that's kind of like weird. So if they are going to, I don't know, if they are extremely smart or before actually you know, setting the port number, I guess they translate that to hexadecimal and they send the port number, I don't know. But we did find them. I mean, not that many occurrences, but you do find them. And the last one uh, is what we call low byte addresses. For the most part, these addresses have all of the bits set to zero, and you just set this last number. But there are people that, instead of just setting the, you know, the, the, the low order 16 bits, they set those two numbers to a small integer. So you could get something like, for example, uh, here 1, and then colon, let's say 100. Okay? So that number is never going to get like to FFFF, but it's always going to be in the range between 0 and 100, so to speak. As you could tell from each of these cases, uh, the search space is not 64 bits at all. I mean, in, for example, in, that case, in this case, you have to vary this number from 0 to 100, same thing here. Uh, when you, if you're trying to look at addresses that embed the service port, Obviously, there are going to be only a few possibilities there, let's say 80 for uh, HTTP, 25 for SMTP, and so on. So in most of these cases, actually, the, you know, the, um, uh, the search space is not, uh, is not 64 bits at all. Now, in the first versions of the, of, this, of the scanning tool that I produced, essentially, you had to, let's say, specify a prefix and then tell the tool what was the, um, let's say, the address pattern that you were targeting, okay? Which obviously wasn't that nice because you have to obtain the address, look at the address, and try to come up with a pattern, and then, you know, run the attack tool with the specific option. So, oops. Uh, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. You have two, essentially, if you want to run the, you know, the attack tool to do this, you essentially have two options. First one, uh, you specify a prefix and you specify the address type. Second one, which is obviously what you'll use most of the time, now the tool is able to actually uh, infer what's the uh, pattern that the interface ID is following. So um, you don't really, let's say, need to set, uh, you know, to specify the specific interface ID type. Um, let's see, let's show some examples. Uh, So this was in my own copy, this was the back comment, so forget about those. But this is the actual output of the scanning tool, okay? So what I did, obviously I knew, I mean I had scanned this site before, <laughs> uh, so I knew the trick already. But uh, NetBSD, okay? I was, I'm, so I, you know, grabbed the, uh, the quite a record for NetBSD, which is this one. And then I decided to scan the slash 64 corresponding to that one. And these are the numbers, the addresses that I found. I mean, the reason for which I showed this particular one, because it's, uh, let's say, the funniest one. Uh, if you look at the address patterns, they are clearly server ports, OK? So there's an address which is colon colon 21, FTP, colon colon 25, SMTP, colon colon 53, and this one, it's kind of like what we were saying before. This could be like the server number and then the service port, okay? Um, then you can do it like, uh, 
this, let's say the automatic way to running this would be something like uh, these are clearly low byte addresses, okay? And there's another thing before we wait for the results. If you, uh, let me show you this one, for example. If you run the minus B option, before actually showing you the results, the tool will actually print on the screen what are the address ranges that it is targeting, okay? Now, if you look at the address ranges, for example, the first one here, it uses 21 for the low 16 bits, and then a number from zero to five for the next one. Why? We are targeting possible FTP servers. So we are trying to find the server one, server uh, two, three, four, five. Then we do it the other way around, here. Because there's people that put the service port, you know, first, and then the server number. Uh, obviously, you find the same thing for, let's say, usual ports 22, 23, 25, blah, 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 blah. And if you go down and you see these funny numbers, this is for the people that encode the same values in hexadecimal. So what the tool does, it has a table inside with the, let's say, most usual port numbers, and then it does all the possible combinations so that you don't have to do them yourself. Um, let's see. Top, top. Another thing that you could do, I think it was, oops. So what I did here, forget about the, the, I run the tool in this way. Here I'm scanning the same side, not in automatic mode. I'm setting one, I'm forcing one specific address pattern. And let's say that I know that that side is employing servers that were manufactured by Dell, okay? What the tool is doing, it's looking up in the, uh, you know, in the database of IEEE OUIs, and then it come up with the, all the address ranges for the OUIs that have been assigned to Dell, okay? It also, I mean, doesn't make much sense to explain it, but it also orders the OUIs because for a vendor that has lots of them, and the first one was assigned, let's say, in the 80s, it's extremely likely that you are not going to find any of so, those systems. So it reorders the uh, OUIs so that first you try the most recent ones and the, then you try the last ones. Um, there are so many different like uh, options. Uh, one that is quite interesting that you know I'm not going to run because of the time that we have. But if you are using, for example, virtualization technologies, let's say VirtualBox or VMware, they use specific IEEE OUIs. Uh, so uh, you, in that case, you don't even need to target like the whole range of OUIs, but you target just those specific your OUIs. And there are specific options in the tools, like you can say, okay, I want to target VirtualBox virtual machines. So the tool automatically will come up with, a, with a, you know, the, the right addresses. Can I just add to that? Yeah. Can I just add to that? The microphone goes live. Uh, this one, okay, it works. So basically what you're talking about is not really something like really um, deeply skillful social engineering because good customers sometimes work with vendors and they do different case studies. So actually if you do a little bit of your research, you're able to find information about who is using what vendor, who they work with. So again, that just um, decreases the surface attack even more. Yeah, okay, just a tip. Um. So some some uh, conclusions about the you know uh, address scanning attacks for IPv6. They are feasible, but typically harder than in IPv4. Essentially, I mean, there's no way out without using your brain. Okay, so you can't just do like brute force. Um, now we will see in the next presentation that this is um, 
something that is improving because the, I mean, improving for some of the types of addresses. For example, when it comes to the manually configured addresses, there's nothing that you, know, you can do about it. People just set the addresses in whatever way they do. But for the Slack addresses, the ones that embed the uh, link layer address, the MAC address, um, the recommended uh, sc scheme to actually set the interface ID was changed earlier this year. So in the next presentation, I will show, for example, if you start a fresh copy of Fedora, they already you know, switch to the new, ways of, the new way of generating the interface IDs, so you don't get predictable addresses, in a sense. So that's something that has improved, if you want. Side comment, Microsoft, I don't know since which version of Windows, but I mean, they didn't completely solve the problem, but when it comes to, the, to scanning attacks, they, uh, they don't generate the interface IDs in the traditional ways. They don't embed MAC addresses in the interface ID. So when it comes to the scanning attacks, it's not possible to do them against Windows, at least in this way, okay? Because you could have like 100 boxes, and each of those boxes is going to have like a randomized interface ID. That's something that, let's say, they were ahead of uh, the rest, so to speak. Um, okay. Well, this is what I was uh, mentioning before. It is possible to make them unfeasible, the scanning attacks. Uh, when it comes to systems that you're manually configuring, well, it's just a matter of you, you know, not, let's say, using more bits in the address uh, or not using, let's say, patterns. But for addresses that result from, uh, let's say, Slack, uh, it's just a matter of implementations being updated uh, to 72.17 and uh, RFC uh, 80.64. Essentially, AD64 tells, tells you that you should be doing 7217. So the algorithm is, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that was, let's say, an uh, ITF process. Let's call that. Let's call it that way. Um, OK. Uh, obviously, so uh, this is something that is, you know, it's kind of like a moving target. So you have the addresses that were following patterns, and then there is something that, you know, improved that. Uh, so it's like, you know, one chasing the other. Uh, eventually, you know, if things move to, let's say, 72, 17, and let's say addresses now, they don't follow patterns anymore, well, obviously, attackers will have to, uh, you know, start exploring other. I mean, actually, we are going to discuss some of them, but obviously, they will, uh, they will have no other option than to, you know, start exploring other techniques for for finding systems. Again, this is this RFC 7217 is only addressing uh, the addresses that are produced with Slack. Now, for example, if you in your network you are using the HCP version six. Well, it depends on uh, what's the algorithm that your DHCP server employs to list the addresses. There are some servers that they just try to randomize the addresses. There are others that you know uh, select the addresses in very predictable ways. So, uh, okie dokie. Um, next topic is about extension headers. Uh, most of the stuff that we will discuss surrounding this is not that nice, so to speak. Uh, so it's mostly about bad news. Um, so the first, uh, the first part is, uh, I'm not going to you know, uh, dedicate too much time for this, but the summary of uh, this tool that we are going to discuss, well, first of all, Path6. Why is this, called, uh, why is this tool called Path6? Well, because every other name was already used. So trace root, trace root 6, trace 6, and all of that were employed. So that's why it, uh, you know, it took this name. And what is this tool about? It's essentially trace root with support for IPv6 extension headers. So I tried to use the tools that were already available, uh, but you know, the different implementations of trace root were not supporting extension headers. Again, there was no option that to implement a new tool. This is how you uh, employ the tool. Essentially, uh, you, know, you specify a target system, and you, know, you have too many different options for specifying different things, like you know, different kind of extension headers, different size of extension headers. You can also use different proof packets, ICMP, TCP, UDP, whatever you want. Okay, the tool ends up working like uh, you know, like trace root. With the only difference is that you can use this tool to actually check, for example, if extension headers are working on that path or not. That's the only difference or improvement uh, with respect to to trace root. Uh, well, different options, 
Uh, so for example, in this case, let's say in the lowest one uh, here, you can see like a sample command line to, uh, well, uh, you know, run trace route against some destination. We use TCP as the proof, uh, proof uh, for the proof packets and destination port 80. Why you might want to do that? Well, because maybe there's a firewall in between that is blocking some of the packets, but let's say if you use some specific uh, packet type that is allowed through the firewall, you might still be able to do trace route. You can also set the, you know, the flags in the TCP bits, virtually everything. Uh, you can use TCP, ICMP, UDP, and I don't know what else. The whole point actually of, you know, uh, of, let's say, coding this tool wasn't, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't about coding the tool itself for the pleasure of it, because it wasn't really a pressure. But um, the thing was that a few years ago, there was a lot of talk in, um, in the V6 working group of the IETF about, uh, you know, whether uh, ISPs uh, or carriers, there were dropping packets with extension headers, okay? Now, People were saying like, well, about 20% of the packets uh, that, are, that employ fragmentation get dropped. And uh, at least I wasn't able to get like, you know, concrete measurements uh, or like, yeah, some kind of like experiment showing that that number actually came from somewhere. I don't know if it was like just gossip or whatever you want to call it. So the, let's say the initial goal of coding this tool was actually to be able to do that kind of measurement. Something similar to what I mentioned before. I grabbed the list of you know, servers from the Alexa side, and then obviously what I was going to do is, first of all, let's say try uh, you know, employ trace route without any kind of extension headers to check that actually the path was working, and then run trace route again with different kinds of extension headers, okay? Now, if without extension headers, you know, things were working perfectly well, but now with extension headers, they were not, then that meant that you know, the packets were being dropped at, at some point. So trying to, um, I can show this one later, um, trying to provide a summary of the results that uh, we found. These are the results for web server addresses, mail server addresses, and name servers uh, for different types of extension headers. So this means, for example, if you are sending packets with uh, destination options of eight bytes to a web, a web server, in 10% of the cases, they get dropped. If you use hope by hope options, you get like a 40% drop rate. Uh, then for, what's that, Fr uh, fragment header, so fragmented traffic, you get like a 30% of drop rate. <coughs> now, for the most part, it's not that it's nice that this is the situation, but you could say, okay, well, I don't really use destination options for the web, so, I mean, it's not nice, but at the end, I, I don't care. Hope by hope, uh, I don't. Fragmentation for web servers either, same thing applies to mail servers. Why, when you look at name servers, this looks really ugly. Why? Because for, you know, for DNS, you do use UDP. And obviously, in UDP, you cannot repackage data. And if you know, what you are transferring is like too large, you, can actually, you actually have to fragment this. And look at the drop rate that you get for fragments in the case of name servers. Uh, I, I think this could be like, you know, subject of further, let's say, studies. Let's say my easier guess is that probably things are falling back to IPv4 here. Or if you really need to, you know, use fragmentation, in many cases, you know, the packets might be being dropped, but you might fall down to the corresponding before addresses. And that's why, you know, somehow the problem gets circumvented. Uh, this other slide, uh, what it tries to show is, in those cases in which packets get dropped, well, are they dropped by the um, destination autonomous system or by some other autonomous system? Now, my, um, let's say, the reason for which we try to measure this is that when we publish the initial, well, first of all, when I found the initial results, I spent quite a few days trying to find bugs in the tool because I said, well, the results cannot be that bad. So, I was looking, 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 trying different things, and eventually, well, the results were that bad. So there were no bugs in the tools. And obviously, you know, people don't like bad results. So there, there, some, people, some guys were saying, well, but maybe these packets are being dropped by the destination IS. So at the end of the day, the guy that is dropping the packets is the guy to whom you are sending the, the, the traffic. So he knows better. Well, in quite a few cases, you might see in this slide, 
it's not act the packets are not actually being robbed by the destination AES. So there's some guy that is forwarding packets for you that is just de just decided for his some reasons that he's not going to allow packets with extension headers. Now this is something that uh, I mean it's not in the slide, but um, you know David discussed IPsec in in his talk. Now there's a sub part of it which um, I mean I didn't include it in the in the report that we published, but IPsec employs extension headers, and extension headers corresponding to IPsec also get dropped, which is not nice. So we come from a world in which you couldn't use, let's say, IPsec natively because of the NATs. Now, in theory, you can, but the packets with extension headers are dropped. Uh, I mean, I don't have much more to add. It's just, just a messenger. Um, I'm going back to this slide because let's say that you want to use some extension header for something, and let's say that you don't want to be running, you know, the path six tool to try to try to find, you know, who's the guy that is dropping the, you know, the packets. So this tool, which is actually a script, black hole six, essentially what it does is it runs trace root against the destination without extension headers, then with extension headers, and then it tries to find out what's the system that is dropping your packet and also informs you of the autonomous system number and so on. So if you wanted to complain to the guy dropping the packets, let's say this tool would make it easy to actually to find out who's the guy that is dropping packet. Obviously, before you get like too violent, be aware that it might give you false positives. So it's like you're screaming, hey, you're dropping my packets. Well, I mean, in some cases, it might throw some false positives. Um, so what does this all mean? Uh, there are two different points of view. Uh, well, the first one is that, and this is one that is not nice, and I think there's work to do in different areas, like you know, even having this conversation is something that is supposed to help. Uh, that right now you don't have a very good situation for uh, using extension headers. And if you are planning to, uh, let's say, use IPsec on, uh, you know, without any encapsulation in, IPv in IPv6, well, you should raise awareness about this kind of stuff. I'm not saying that you're going to be able to change it. I'm just saying that this is something that at least people should be uh, you know, aware of. Now the other part is that you know I try to follow everything that gets like published on uh, published on the topic. Like I have so many alerts on Google whenever there's something that says IPv6 security, I, I try to read it. And if you look in the last let's say four or five years, a lot of the stuff that was published on um, IPv6 security is about extension headers. Like, well, I found that if I include this number of extension headers, uh, I can evade snort or this firewall or that other firewall. So. For quite a lot of people, extension headers are seen like uh, as something that is great for, for attackers, right? Now, if you look at the, these previous numbers, well, even from the attacker's point of view, they are not that nice. Why? Because if I want to attack a remote system, actually, if I put extension headers, I'm blocking my own attack. <laughs> so this could be like, you could, <laughs> you could think of this as a security f uh, feature, like it's a, <laughs> an implicit firewall, you could say. Um, I mean, obviously, for if in many cases, if you are, let's say, um, attacking a local network, yeah, they might be of use. There are so many different kind of security devices that are not able to process extension headers well. But if what you're doing is something against a system that is in a remote network and your packets have to traverse the public internet, you better do something else because you know uh, there are a lot of chances that your packets are going to you know get dropped. Um, okay, okay. So uh, we are now going to cover just uh, you know one attack for neighbor discovery uh, and one for Slack. I mean, obviously the tools support many of them, but the idea is just to show you know how easy it is to reproduce this stuff. First of all, uh, no neighbor discovery. Essentially, they say the short version of it is that this is IPv6 version of ARP. Okay with the only caveat that the traffic is much more complex. Why? Because in the IPv4 world, ARP was running on layer two, okay? So they were like packets running directly on layer two. Whereas in the case of um, IPv6, all of these packets are ICMP packets. That means that since they are ICMP packets, they 
run over IP, and if they run over IP, they can have extension headers, fragmentation, etc., etc. To put it in a different way, this is the equivalent of saying that you can fragment our packets. Okay? Um, how you know uh, neighbor discovery works? Well, it's kind of like the equivalent. I assume this is just a refresher for you know those that don't remember. But essentially, if you need to send a packet on the local network, you have to be able to map the v6 address to a link layer address. You ask on the local net. Oops, that was fast. <laughs> Yeah, I'm usually late, so that couldn't possibly happen. Uh, there you go. T -t 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 -t. So let's say that you want to send packets to um, another system. You have to ask on the local network who, what's the MAC address for that system. Then the target system will respond with the MAC address. And essentially, after that, you store that information in the neighbor cache, which is the same thing as they are similar to the ARP cache. And then you can send your own packet. Okay. Now, what's the reason for which I, you know, I try to stress these last two bullets? Well, obviously for each mapping that you discover, you store that information in memory. Why? Because obviously you don't want to have to redo the mapping for every packet that you send. Now, one problem that we're not going to show here, but is related to this, is that uh, many implementations, they don't enforce a limit on the number of entries of the, in the neighbor cache. I don't know because I haven't checked myself. Probably they don't do that for ARP either. But the thing is that in IPv4, since you know the, the size of uh, the networks are so small, there's kind of like an implicit limit. Okay, if you have a slash 24, well, you're not, we are never going to get more than 255 entries there. Now, if you have a slash 64 in IPv6, if you don't enforce a limit, well, there's, going, there's not going to be any real limit. So you find that many implementations, I, I haven't you know, been uh, keeping track of which ones have been, let's say, uh, patched and which ones I haven't, but many implementations, they don't enforce limits. And if you, let's say, you somehow produce uh, neighbor discovery traffic, eventually the, uh, the neighbor, uh, neighbor uh, cache grows uh, so much that it takes up all system memory and the system crash. Uh, with FreeBSD, I had it in, a, in another slide. That was kind of like the first attack that I reproduced in, uh, in, in IPv6. And the funny, part, the funny part was that you would get like kernel messages that said something like, something weird is going on. <laughs> now, the funny part is like the system telling you that it's about to die. So you get a, something weird is going on, something weird is going on. I don't have more memory, uh, you know, system panic. Uh, I mean, other implementations do the same without much talking, so to speak. Uh, that's, uh, that's a side comment. Uh, one of the ways in which you can generate lots of neighbor discovery traffic is when you send a lot of packets to a target network. Okay? Let's say that you are all part of the same subnet and I'm proving different addresses. Okay? Well, each packet that I send is going to trigger neighbor discovery traffic. Uh, and as a result of that, you will see that in many cases in which people are scanning remote networks, particularly if the search space is big, they end up crashing the remote router if it, if it doesn't enforce limits on the neighbor cache. So that's the reason for which if for reasons that are not my problem, you are going to try to scan some site, well, you should, let's say, limit the rate at which you're sending packets because if the goal is to actually find systems that are alive, what you are doing is actually taking them off the network, okay? Uh, well, what are the attacks that you can you know, do with neighbor discovery? Well, the same thing as in IPv4. Essentially, you have an IP address, you map that address to some link layer address. So if, for example, the address is non-existent, there's, there, you just you know, uh, spoof a neighbor advertisement, well, the packets are going to be discarded. And if you direct or redirect the packets to your own system, you could do man in the middle attack. There's nothing different from the, you know, the IPv4 wall. Uh, this is how you run the, the tool. I mean, obviously, if you do man ANA6, blah, blah, um, uh, you can you know, tell what each option is for. But the main important, or the most important ones are first one is interface. That's the interface on which you are going to be listening for packets. The second one, uh, minus uh, T, is the address that you want to impersonate. That's an IPv6 address that you want to impersonate. And then minus E, that's the MAC address. 
So if you just want the packets to be dropped, you just come up with some non-existent non address. Or if you want to do money in the middle, obviously it's your own address. Uh, mitigations, OK? First of all, uh, and that's something that David mentioned, OK? Uh, the first question that you should probably ask yourself is whether you are doing something about this for the IPv4 case, OK? I'm not saying that it's right not to do anything in the IPv4 case, but if you're not doing anything in the IPv4 case and you're running a dual stack network, then just worrying about one you know, family of the attacks, but not for both, doesn't make much sense. Now, let's assume that you do something about this. So what are the possible options? First one is something that is called ND snooping, or the IETF version is savvy. Uh, short version of it, the guy that probably wrote the RFCs will kill me for this, because you are summarizing all the work in like two sentences. But essentially, you have a device that tries to learn the real mappings. Obviously, you start running the network, you learn the mappings. And then that device, a layer to switch, it tries to police you know, traffic that you know, is uh, now um, you know, advertising different mappings. Uh, that's one of them. Obviously, you might wonder, well, uh, will I be able to do it in my network or not? Well, that depends on the device that you're employing. Maybe it has support for this, or it doesn't. Uh, the other one, it's uh, monitoring neighbor discovery traffic. This, is, this doesn't prevent the problem. It just detects that the problem has happened. Uh, you might want to do it or not. This is the equivalent to, uh, you might remember the tool ARPWatch from IPv4. This is the equivalent to ARPWatch. Second one, which is easier to tell than to do, is you know, to restrict access to the local network. I mean, obviously, for most cases, you can do this. But there's people, uh, let's say, in the, there's like the two extremes, right? So at times, you get to places where they have a large network. We, they have thousands of systems. And they don't even have like at least a separate network for, let's say, the people that, just to, that has to get some work done. So you are not going to be able to employ this option that much, but at least have, let's say, one option for guests, and they go and kill each other there. And then you have the network <laughs> that you can use while they are killing each other, so to speak. Uh, this one, same thing. I've only seen one place where they do static entries. I was once at the security conference. Uh, and in the, let's say, the leaflet that they you know, give to you with the agenda and so on, they will give you the information for setting uh, static entries, but for the IPv4 case, not for v6. The other one is send. Send is something that is, uh, let's say, extremely nice on paper, and it's extremely nice on paper. <laughs> uh, it's extremely complex from my perspective. I probably read the specification four times to get an idea. And if I had to like completely explain it again, I probably had to read the spec once more. Uh, it's supposed to use a public key infrastructure, which would give you an idea of how easy it is to deploy. Um, there, and then there are two other things. First of all, there's no support in like most major operating systems. So if you grab Windows, they don't support it. Linux, they don't support it, and so on. And the other, let's say, the other question that you might want to answer yourself before you even consider actually deploying Send. I mean, you will not be able to, but let's say if somehow you could, <laughs> is um, whether it actually makes sense to, you know, use this very uh, heavy and expensive machinery just to address you know, ARP attacks? I don't think so. But uh, it's there. And for completeness sake, I, uh, you know, I have listed it. One side comment. I haven't tried this myself, but this is like a you know, big uh, warning sign. Uh, for ND snooping, uh, it would be quite possible that uh, an attacker might be able to circumvent that control by employing extension headers. I haven't tested that myself. So that's like a, the reason for which, let's say, I provided the command line in the previous slide, is that if you are running one of these boxes that allow you to do this, well, try to run the tool with extension headers, because it's quite possibly the case that you can circumvent this mitigation. Uh, so the other part of neighbor discovery is Slack. OK? Uh, brief overview. In V6, you have two. Let's say two auto, auto or two automatic configuration mechanisms. Ten minutes before end of this talk, and then fifteen minutes. Okay. 
Uh, so essentially you have two of them. For those that have been following this stuff, it's kind of like uh, tricky and it's a subject of uh, very, a lot of religious battles. Uh, the Android people, they don't want to support the HCP. Microsoft at some point in time, I think that changed as far as I've been able to check. They were not supported the RDNS option for configuring DNS server. So uh, if you were deploying a network, essentially you had to do both of them. So you have, let's say, two mandatory options in practice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so this is one is mandatory and the other one is optional. It's like quotes there. So how does Slack work? Well, essentially, you connect a system to a network. It sends a router, solic router solicitation. And there's a, a router that essentially answers back with all the configuration information that it needs. I will skip this, but the idea is that you, you, know, you ask the network for configuration information. The router will actually give you a prefix that you should use for generating your addresses. And before actually you. Uh, you know, configure that address or start using that address, you have to check that that address is unique. That's a process called that or duplicate address detection. Essentially, the way that works is you send, you try to map that address. It's like sending a neighbor solicitation for that address, and you wait for responses. If nobody responds, then you assume that that address is not in use. So what are the attacks that you can do with uh, Slack? Well, first of all, uh, you can attack the duplicate address detection mechanism. Why? Because, well, you can connect to the network and pretend that you own every address that, you know, other systems are trying for uniqueness. So it's like, do you have that address? Yes, I do. Do you have that address? Yes, I do. So essentially, you have, all, you have everything. Uh, this is how you run the tool, OK? This is the, let's say, this is the first one is the ECS version, which is essentially no matter where the queries come from, you should. And then there's this other one in which you restrict the attack to uh, a specific MAC address, OK? Obviously, if you are doing this in, a, let's say, in some environment that is not a lab, you should be doing this, OK? Otherwise, people will start complaining. <laughs> um, this is just a filter, OK? So the only thing that you are doing is restricting the systems that you are trying to attack to those that employ only that MAC address. Another attack that you can employ, I mean, without getting that much into the details, is you know whenever there's a router advertisement that is sent on the local network, it has a value that is called lifetime or router lifetime. That value tells you for how long you uh, are uh, expected to be able to use that information. Okay. Now the idea is that in let's say normal scenarios, you get those uh, router advertisements all the time, and you know that that timer never expires. Okay, so it re gets refreshed all the time. Now, as an attacker, what you can do is just spoof one router advertisement with a lifetime of zero. That means that every system that at some point in time they had you know configured the network to use you know uh, addresses and default routes and so on, you are essentially telling them that it's not possible to use that information anymore. So that's a way of DOSing the, the, you know, the entire network with one packet. I mean, you have to keep sending the packets because you know, the legitimate packet will come afterwards. So you always have to you know, fire your packet after that. Uh, again, well, this is simple. The, the, it only has a few parameters. Uh, interface is the you know, network interface card. Router address, because that's the link local address that you want to impersonate. You have to pretend that you are the legitimate router. And this one, target address, is the, you know, the target of your attack. So if you use the all nodes multicast address, you are doing a DOS to all systems. But you can also send the same packets to specific systems, OK? So if you want to just take off the network some specific ones. Uh, mitigation for Slack. Well, same question as before. Are you doing something for the DHCP version 4 case? If you're not, well, it's not a different scenario, OK? Now, assuming that you are, uh, you know, you are doing some, something about the ACP version 4, uh, these are some of the things that you might want to do. Uh, one of them is router advertisement guard, OK? Um, Essentially, that's kind of like the, if you do DHCP snooping in IPv4, well, this is the same thing, but for Slack. Now, most of the implementations, they are, uh, let's say, susceptible of being uh, circumvented uh, by using attack packets that employ extension headers. 
to put in a different way, rather than sending plain uh, RAs, you just add some extension header in between, and they don't even, you know, they, they don't even identify that that packet must be blocked. Now, without naming names, uh, this was reported, but not just by me, by other people at the time, and to vendors, some router vendors. And the funny part was that the response from the vendors was, well, we are not going to fix this, because the solution to the problem is send. Send, like send is impossible, okay? So the, the, the sad part is not that these devices are easy to circumvent, but actually the, there doesn't seem to be any plans to actually patch this, and it's possible to do it, but uh, uh, the other ones are the same thing, you know, restrict access, employee send, and, and so on. So let's say that in this particular case, if you were doing the HCP uh, snooping for IP before, what you should be doing here is something like RA guard. At times you find this feature with this name, but it, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a filtering policy. It's like you have a switch with different ports, and you want to allow uh, RA packets only on the you know the port where the real router is supposed to be connected. That's it. Um, That's a question. Yeah. When you ask the vendors to fix that problem of being able to bypass the RA guard by adding the headers on, did you ask them to? allow those packets through with valid headers, or did you ask them to drop any packets that have any headers in? That's dead easy for them and would solve the problem. Uh, I ask them to, um, so what you should actually, what they do uh, is like, if you get a packet, the thing that they are doing wrong is that they expect the, let's say, the payload, in this case ICMP, to be, to be right after the IPv6 uh, packet. Now, that doesn't make sense with the IPv6 packet structure, because extension headers mean that if you want to get to the upper payload, you need to jump through all the extension headers. Now, they don't do that. very difficult to resolve and the reason it's difficult to resolve is without you going as as Fernando says down the whole length of that extension head train you don't know there's router advertisement there to check so it suddenly becomes something that's extremely difficult to do in hardware extremely difficult to do quickly so I actually have sympathy for them it needs to be implemented in the end nodes so the end nodes that will have to Traverse the extension headers should drop packets where there are router advertisements with extension headers. Hi, um, David Freeman, Clarence. I'm speaking about a, a related topic later, but this is a, actually a problem that we had to deal with, and, and there is no nice way of dealing with it, especially when you're working with mainstream vendor hardware and software. Um, really, the solution to it is uh, the filtering of particular types and configurations of extension headers and even header lengths for different types of expected payloads and destination <laughs> multicast max. It's really not nice, but there are very few options in modern software to do it. I think that at the end of the day, what if you're running a network, what you're probably going to do, if you want to mitigate this stuff, you will end up dropping all packets with extension heads. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of comments about upper layer attacks. So, uh, to make the story short, I was trying to find out a tool to perform the same attacks that you do in IPv4, but for the IPv6 wall. And out of frustration, I didn't find any. Uh, so, I built, you know, a V6 version of the same tools. This is just one example, sim fluid over IPv6. I mean, I guess there should be like lots of tools like this, but there were not. I mean, same thing, you know, same, same thing as with the other tools. You can set as many options as you want, and there are you know, so many different kinds of attacks that you can, let's say, perform. Like, for example, you can trick a system not just to have like, uh, not a proper sim fluid, but even actually cause connections to be established, to, to, for the system to think that you know, uh, the connections are, have actually uh, been established. Mitigation for upper layer attacks, um, it's kind of like the same as in the IPv4 case. The only thing that you should keep in mind is that if in the IPv4 wall you are doing some kind of rate limiting or filtering or blah, 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 based on the IPv4 address, well, in IPv6 you should probably do that based on some prefix. I'm not saying whether that's a slash 64 or slash something, but uh, a prefix. Why? Well, because each system can you know, pick so many addresses from the local network that just filtering a single address doesn't, it's not going to solve anything. Uh, and the last one, this is quite, quite interesting. Um, let's say that 
let's assume that all vendors already replace everything that they had for, uh, you know, or they replace the scheme that they had for, you know, generating addresses with Slack, and everyone employs uh, addresses that are not predictable, okay? So you as an attacker would have to find a way to actually learn about those systems if, if you want to somehow do a port scan or whatever that is. Um, there are some features in the DNS which are obviously the same as in IPv4, like for example, try to do some transfers and so on. There's nothing different there. But one uh, specific, let's say, technique that uh, it's very interesting for the IPv6 case is actually using reverse mappings. I mean, this reverse mapping stuff is that either you already know it, or if you don't, you, it's going to take more than five minutes, okay? But the idea is that, uh, <laughs> The idea is that, for example, let's say when you run traceroute and you get responses from you know, difference in between and you get those names of the systems, well, there's something in there that is translating IP addresses into domain names. So that's like the opposite mapping of what you usually do, okay? So what this technique tries to do is try to walk all the tree of reverse mappings. So uh, the zone that you use is IP6, IP6 ARPA. And then for each uh, digit of the IPv6 address, you have one, you know, one node in the DNS. It actually tries to walk that tree, okay? We are not really scanning addresses. We are not sending proof packets to IPv6 addresses, but actually try to uh, you know, find out whether the addresses are valid or not by walking the tree of uh, reverse mappings. And the idea is uh, simple. Uh, if you get an NX domain error for some specific part of the tree, that means that you should completely, uh, let's say, ignore the rest of that part of the tree, okay? So you start at the top hierarchy, and you start, you know, trying the first level of the, you know, of, of, uh, of the tree. And you start discarding parts. Now, um, obviously, if you, you could do it manually, but it wouldn't be a very enjoyable experience. So. There's this tool, this is a tool uh, that is in THC uh, IPv6 attack toolkit. It's very straightforward to use, uh, DNS Revenum 6. This is a, a catching DNS server, and this is a network prefix, okay? So I run the tool already. Um, it doesn't take long, but uh, it was easier. Uh, where was this? So what did I do here? Uh, Unfortunately, it's like all of us that present on this stuff, we use the case of RIPE. Uh, I don't know if they like it or not, but it's uh, <laughs> let's, say that, let's say that everyone knows that it works so that we keep using it, and hopefully they will never fix this, because otherwise we will have to target somewhere else. Uh, so uh, what I did here is just, first of all, I obtained the query record for the, you know, the website of RIPE. And then I took the slash 48, which is what I assume that they have in their network, okay? Then you run the tool in this way. The tool, what it's going to do is, you know, walk the tree of the reverse mappings. And this is the stuff that you get. Now, there are, I mean, two nice things. First of all is that, I mean, in this case, if you look at the addresses, you could say that you could have probably found most of them by doing an address scan, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are two things to fix there. Uh, but the other one is that, I mean, if the mappings are okay, also the information that you get from the corresponding names might you know, give you some indication of what the system is being used for. I mean, there are many systems. Lagnik had the same thing. And I reported that and they fixed it, so I'm not going to report this one because the ones we <laughs> run out of examples. But there are many networks that they do this. Um, obviously, this is useful. Uh, if, obviously, if somebody is troubleshooting something with your network, they are able to learn the name. But uh, unfortunately, obviously, this gives a lot of information to the attackers. So the mitigation for this is uh, essentially, the only case in which you use uh, or you need actually uh, reverse DNS mappings is for mail servers. For the rest, what I use suggest is just don't configure them or use a wheel card so that everything maps to something. Okay. Uh, conclusions. Well, my this was my my take. Uh, there's a lot of stuff if you look at B6 that. It's some kind of like port of what we had in before. Like, you know, the neighbor discovery attacks is kind of like the same thing. And this is, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Uh, 
but um, there's, I guess, a little bit of truth to this. It's like if you look, for example, at the people that wrote the specs, at the people that wrote the code, and so on, well, there are completely different sets of, of people. Uh, probably the part that is uh, more tricky is that there are things that, uh, let's say, from my perspective, could have been better in the, in the specs. Uh, but, well, we, that's where we are. Um, and I, as I made the comment before, please don't take the, any of this discussion as, oh, I, don't, I will not discuss IPv6 because this guy said that that's not the, that's not the, the let's say, the, what I want you to take from this presentation. But rather, you know, being aware about things that are there and what you can do to, uh, uh, you know, fix them. Well, my thank you to Veronica, uh, Tim, Axians, and so on. I don't know if there are any questions. Yes, we can take, we're a little bit behind, but we can still take a couple now and yeah, push the rest to the okay. end. So it's one behind 10, you, I think. 10,000 steps? Uh, there's one behind you while I do my 10,000 steps. <laughs> Thank you, very interesting. When you were talking about packets of extension headers being dropped and pointing out that that includes IPsec, uh, do you have any idea whether um, it's a basically a random choice of packets with those extension headers that are dropped, or are sites uniformly dropping every packet with an extension header? Well, so is it a denial of service, or is it a performance impact? Well, actually, there's, and it's not that, I mean, like with everything in life, you might also have people that they do it because they do it, but uh, there are reasons for doing that, and the reason is simple. Uh, in most networks, you might be employing some kind of filtering either to protect your own systems or to protect your customers, okay? Usually, the kind of filtering that you need is, for example, filtering packets that are uh, sent to some specific service. That means that every time that you get a packet, you need to uh, actually be able to tell what's the protocol that's inside and what's the port number. Now, what's the problem with the extension headers? You get this packet that is this long, and let's say with lots of extension headers, and when you want to do the filtering, you have to jump from one place to another. Well, in some devices, I mean, that varies from one device to another. When uh, you have to process extension headers, that means that you have to process the packet on the slow path, meaning that performance goes like this. Mm -hmm. And you know, in practice, that means that you cannot let that happen. So that means that if there is a chance that those packets are going to you know, do that to your systems, you just drop them. In other cases, um, you have systems that can only look you know, that deep into the packet. For example, they can only look like 60 bytes into the packet. But obviously, as an attacker, it's like, OK, you can look 60 bytes. Then I put 100 bytes of headers, and then what? So I can always you know, take you to a point in which if you really want to look deep into the packet, you might have to do like software processing of that or spend a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. Um, question or, or comment maybe. Um, in the scanning part of your talk, you made it sound uh, several times with comments like, what are people smoking or so, uh, as a bad design choice if they have a low entropy host name. But I would like to point out, you have scanned what I would describe as public infrastructure. These people want to be found. They are the top million websites. They have web pages. They are found. They're meant to be found. They're probably even paying search engine optimizers to be found. Uh, they have published their email addresses. Uh, they publish their addresses on the DNS. Um, what is the point of randomizing addresses, making addresses uh, difficult to guess if in the end it's a public service. Is this not just a form of security by obscurity? Uh, to name it with the well-known uh, bad name for it. Why yeah. should we bother? Why should we even claim it's a bad idea? I, as a network designer, wouldn't want to be told off by my manager, look, you are a bad network manager because some of your IPv6 addresses do not have at least 48 bytes, uh, bits of uh -huh. entropy in it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I keep my end nodes secure, and if I can be scanned, for many systems, the whole purpose of them is to be found and to be widely used. There's two comments to that. The, the first one is that uh, when I was talking about what are these people smoking, it wasn't actually about the decision of whether, you, whether your addresses are predictable or not, but actually a comment about people you know, claiming that it would be impossible to find systems on an IPv6 network. Okay? 
Now, what you said about the IPv6 addresses is like, I mean, there are two ways of thinking about that. In one case, you could say, okay, you know, uh, my, the address of my web server is predictable. I don't care at the end of the day, it's public or whatever. And in many cases, that might be true. But think about this scenario. Let's say that you are like an ISP and you're hosting websites for, you know, so many different people. Okay, so many different companies. Let's say that I'm interested in your network. I don't care about the specific side. I'm just interested in hacking your network. Then I only need to learn the address of one web server, and then automatically I will learn the address of other servers in your network. I, I don't even know what those servers are about if, or for which company you are hosting them, but they are servers that you're hosting in your own network. So coming from one address, I can find all the other ones. Whereas if the addresses are not predictable, let's say that I find one address, I don't know which other servers you have there. Some of them might be public, others not. If you look at, for example, the, um, you know, when we did the uh, enumeration with reverse DNS, you see names like accounting, and those are clearly not, size that, not, not servers that are public, okay? Now, if the scheme that you use for all of your systems it's a different thing is you say, okay, my web server, my main server, and my name server are predictable. I would say, yeah, it doesn't matter. Now, if what you use in your organization, for example, you use for all of your systems, you set the IPv6 addresses by embedding the IPv4 address, I think that's a bad idea. Because there are many of those systems that, you know, they, they shouldn't be so easy to find. The other thing is that you say, okay, well, is that a good security policy? Well, it's like they say if somebody wants to rob you in the street. Like, uh, I don't know if uh, you have different techniques. Maybe one of them is running. I don't know if it's the, most, the best one. But if you, let's say, you can help that situation from that, that's a good thing. Even like, you know, animals use that or even the human system. Like, you know, your skin is like you the first level of, of, of protection. So you don't get stuff inside your body because the skin protects from that. That doesn't mean that it's the only protection that you have. Once you get something inside your body, you have, I don't know anything about medicine, but there's something inside you that actually go and fight your bacteria or viruses or whatever that is. Uh, again, if the only thing that you do is hide your system, I think that's a very bad idea, if that's the only thing that you do. On the other hand, from the point of view of an attacker, you know, the first step that I need to follow before attacking your network is finding your systems. Now, why do you say me that, that step? Uh, I, I don't want to, if you want to attack my network, I don't want to make it easier for you. Uh, yeah, is it? One minute for your second talk. Yeah. <laughs> no, excellent. I think we can, we can extend into the coffee break and then we will start uh, a bit later okay. uh, with the final block. I will okay. do it, this one very... Keep, keep the questions. Uh, as you say, we still will have some time, hopefully at the end of the day, so uh, you can ask people. Okay. I will do Thanks. this one very quick. This is essentially like, let's say, if you haven't been following the stuff that has been going on at the ITF, this is supposed to be like, you know, the, the summary of what has been going on in the last few years. Uh, so I divided this in two parts, protocol issues and, let's say, operational issues. For the most part, I'm just going to point out documents and try to summarize what they are about in two lines, okay? First one, uh, uh, much of what we talk about uh, in, you know, in my previous presentation has been about addressing. There are, um, uh, there's quite a bit of work that has been done at the ITF. Uh, these two documents here, the first one it does a general analysis of security and privacy considerations for IPv6 addressing. Let's say how the way in which you select addresses can affect your security or privacy. The second one doesn't just follow um, on, doesn't just focus on uh, let's say addresses, but it's a whole document about doing network reconnaissance in IPv6. Like for example, we have pointer for uh, reverse DNS mappings, how you do scanning on a local network, and it's kind of like quite readable as opposed to RFCs in general. So 7707 is kind of like readable. Um, so these two documents essentially discuss problems with, or, uh, with IPv6 addressing. These ones here actually try to mitigate those problems. The first one is an algorithm that uh, is meant to replace the traditional algorithm for generating addresses with Slack, okay? So you used to put your MAC addresses in the interface ID. Well, this document uh, suggests that you should do something else. Um, the second document, that's like procedural stuff at the ITF. So the first document was published, but it didn't update the existing specs. A uh, few years later, 
we publish 8064, which essentially says you should do 7217. That's kind of like the idea. Now, um, as a very, uh, let's say, very brief summary of what this uh, 7217 algorithm is about, essentially, uh, you generate the interface identifiers with this expression. For the time being, uh, you can forget about most of the expression. The important part is that you have a prefix, okay? That's the first argument. And the last one, which is a secret key, okay? And if it's supposed to be a cryptographically secure hash function. So the idea is simple. The secret key, obviously, is secret. Let's say I connect to this network. I learn some prefix that I need to use. And then I will compute that hash function and come up with some interface identifier, okay? Then I move to a different network. The prefix that is announced is different. As a result, the interface ID is going to change. And obviously, as a result of what's the kind of function that you're using there, that number is not predictable, okay? Now, the interesting part, or actually this was the goal of the algorithm, is that if you move back to the original network, you again get the same interface identifier. So the idea is that you get interface identifiers that, are, that don't follow any pattern, that change when you move from one network to another, but they remain stable within the same network. And that's actually a goal from operational reasons. Like typically in many environments like enterprise, people disable temporary addresses because it's like a mess. You see address changes changing to all the time. So this was the, the goal of, of this algorithm. Then, you know, uh, when you look at into the details, well, you have to, for example, add an interface identifier in the expression. Why? Because you might have two different interfaces. And if the only thing that you use in the expression is the prefix and the secret key, if you connect the two interfaces to the same network, they will get the same identifier. But the, you know, conceptually speaking, the important part is the prefix and the secret key. The rest is just details. What you get out of this, as I said before, uh, the interface identifier changes as you move from one network to another, but remains stable within the same network. Um, and you might wonder, okay, well, this RFC got published uh, is there anything going on in the, you know, in the real world? Uh, these are implementations that you know, I was able to check myself. So the first three ones are packages. Well, the first one is the kernel, but then the other two are packages that you usually find in different distributions of, of Linux. Um, and operating systems that ship with this algorithm, enabled by default, macOS uh, Sierra and uh, Fedora. If you grab like a fresh copy of Fedora, you will see that this is what they use. This is a demo, uh, demo not live, uh, of you know, how this algorithm operates. If you look, for example, here, and you look at these two addresses, first of all, if you are used to uh, Slack addresses, you will see that there's no FFFE there. Okay, that you know, word that you always encode, it's not there. It's not there for this address, and it's not there for the link local address either, okay? Now, this is on the first network. Let's say that you move this system to a second network. You can see here that the prefix has changed, okay? Now, the interface ID has completely changed. You can see, for example, in this case, it starts with 48, and the previous one was E17, okay? So, I connected to the first network. This is what I get. I connect to the second one. The interface identifier changes. I connect back to the original network, and I get the same interface identifier, okay? Uh, obviously, if you look at the MAC address, which is supposed to be uh, here, you don't see this address at all in the interface identifier because it's just not employed for that, okay? Uh, I have no idea what's the policy with which different operating systems actually enable this. So you say, okay, I, will this, uh, let's say, be enabled when I upgrade when I, I have no idea, okay? Uh, with fresh installs, yeah. Well, I didn't, in this case, they do. The recommendation in the, um, uh, let's say, the recommendation is that, for example, in this case, it was a, a wired network. If it's a Wi-Fi network, you are supposed to also include in the expression the uh, SSID. So when you move from one network to another, the link, uh, the link local address should change too. Um, and now with side comment, but nowadays, you know, many operating systems are starting to do MAC address randomization. So in this case, if the MAC address is randomized, that might also lead to a change in the, in the um, uh, interface ID. Uh, work on extension headers. Uh, well, this is what fragmentation is about in B6. You use extension headers for fragmented traffic. And uh, this is the format of the, you know, the, the fragment header. 
In the fragment header, you have a value that's called identification here. This is the same thing as IPv4, you just put that value in an extension header. Now, in IPv4, there were a few vulnerabilities that had to do with the identification value being predictable, okay? For example, the people uh, like operating system start setting it to one, then two, and so on, and the same thing happened in the IPv4 world. So, same problem, same solution. Uh, there's one specific case. Uh, if you wonder why we had this, I wonder the same thing. So, I don't have much of um, an answer. But there are cases, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to dig into the details, but there are cases in which you have an original packet such as this one, and your system produces something that we call atomic fragment. Atomic fragment is you have exactly the same packet, but you also add a fragment header. So it's, it's not that the packet is actually fragmented into multiple pieces, it just has a fragment header there. And problems with this is that, for example, there were implementations that rather than saying, okay, well, I have the whole packet here, I don't need to try to reassemble this packet with other packets, they were confused and they tried to get these packets together with other fragments that they had in memory and so on. Uh, that you know, opened the door to quite a lot of attacks. So um, these are documents that were uh, published on the topic. First one, uh, it essentially prohibits the use of fragmentation with neighbor discovery. That makes filtering at, let's say, layer two quite easier. Why you should, uh, let's say, why would you have fragmentation for traffic that is like ARP, okay? Just keep the traffic simple. If it's simple, it's easier to filter. Uh, second one, essentially, uh, discusses the implications of using predictable values for the, uh, for the fragment ID and recommends to do, uh, you know, things in a different way. Third one, uh, third one uh, 7112, addresses one specific case. Uh, at least when it comes to the original IPv6 uh, spec, 2460, you could have a packet with lots of, frag uh, lots of extension headers, and the first fragment would just have the mandatory IPv6 header and a chunk of maybe some extension header, okay? What this RFC says, 70, 7112, is that the first fragment of the packet always, have, always has to have at least the upper layer header. So if it's a TCP packet, well, the TCP header has to be in the first fragment. Why? Well, because if you want to filter traffic, if you cannot assume that the upper layer header is in the first packet, you cannot do a stateless filtering at all, okay? Uh, so this actually, I mean, in, in the real world, this, or let's put things this way, you will not find legitimate traffic like that, but obviously as an attacker, well, if it's, legit, if it's legal, you can do it. So this uh, 7112 actually bans that case. And in the last of the bullets, I included the revision of 2460 because, because it incorporates all of these changes. So this is, uh, let's say, the revised version of the IPv6 specs, the spec that is going to be published soon. For um, atomic fragments, essentially, the first document says you shouldn't generate the fra these, these packets, they don't make any sense. The second document uh, says, well, if you actually receive those packets, this is the way in which you could process them safely, okay? And the other two documents, the last two ones, are essentially other specifications that get updated as a result of banning these atomic fragments. One is the uh, NAT64, essentially. Uh, it's like stateless uh, uh, translation. And the other one is the core IPv6 specification, which is in the process of being revised. Now I mentioned operational issues. So there's a whole document, this one, which is still uh, in the process of being published, about operational uh, security consideration for IPv6. And it covers a lot of stuff, okay? So you might want to read this document, and if you have feedback, you know, send it to the corresponding working group. And um, there are these three ones about uh, first hop security. Uh, two of them is how you implement router advertisement guard and the HCP snooping in a way that it cannot be circumvented, okay? The last one is about source uh, savvy, which is essentially about uh, having your layer two device, keeping a mapping of the, you know, the, or keeping track of the legitimate mappings. So if somebody tries to change the, those mappings, you can essentially block those packets. This is about, let's say, mitigating neighbor discovery attacks. Uh, the, and the last two documents, these are kind of like interesting. The first one is related to something that David mentioned in his presentation. 
Uh, the first one discusses the implications on v6 on an IPv4 network. Short version of the story, you already have IPv6 running one way or another in your network. I don't mind what you do, but you should be aware that that's your case. Then what you do, it's a different thing. And the last one, which is quite interesting, and it can be summarized as this. Let's say that you are using, let's say, OpenVPN. I regularly do that. I connect to this network. I do a tunnel with some machine at home. So at least for part of the path that the packets follow, I know that they are kind of like secure, OK? Now, uh, many of uh, the VPNs implementations that you find out there, they only support IPv4. What happens? If you connect to a network that is dual stack, and you happen to be doing something over IPv6, all of your traffic goes in the clear. Why? Because the VPN just takes care of the IPv4 traffic. That's nothing at all with the IPv6 uh, case. You might ask, well, then if I want to, uh, let's say, if I want to mitigate this, what should I do? Well, one option would be to get a product that doesn't suffer from this problem. What I have done in the past, unfortunately, has been if I really wanted to use my VPN, I was disabling V6. That was my operational, that's not my recommended, uh, let's say, approach. Let's just say that in my case, that's what I had. 